So thank you for doing this, John. Was it all? It was a year ago, less than a week, sitting in your office in London that we were first talking about doing this, which this is a very different thing than what we were first talking about, but it's all <laughs> evolved and it's all been good. And all of that spawned from a discussion I was having with you about an article that you wrote in The Drum on your sense at a time when most people were saying, Prince, dead and dying, that you believe it's important and has a future. From the time that I started doing anything, it was in print, now 36 years ago, and so I always kind of thought print was cool, and particularly for high-end demographic, et cetera, which is what my business connects to. Would you still say today, as you said a year ago, that you think the future of print uh, is uh, strong, viable, and much better than people normally say? Yeah, I think that um, what is driving our business at the moment pretty strongly is digital, uh, and mobile in particular. But we do think that print remains a sort of powerful and very important format uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it has, you know, has uh, advantages of utility and it's tactile and has a strong relationship uh, with readers. Um, it is um, uh, curated. There is a hierarchy of information that I think readers appreciate. Um, I think two important things, I think the economics of print, and you know, I was at a news conference, a media conference like this about 10 years ago and was asked, will newspapers be here in 10 years? And I said then, yes, I'd say the same today. The economics of our print have improved. We make a profit on our newspaper before advertising. Um, I think there might be, you could count the number of newspapers on one hand that could say that, maybe one finger, maybe the New York Times also. Um, what you have is a very loyal audience, a very engaged. People who read the paper, they spend um, 40 minutes plus, Monday to Friday, over an hour at the weekend. So you have that very loyal um, readership with print. So I think it's got attributes that are unique and specific, which will give it um, endurance. Like clearly, we do see digital as the real driver, but print is and will continue to be an important part of our portfolio. So this morning, Jillian said that you do commercial, I know you better than that. Uh, <laughs> I don't do commercials. I know I that. Do commercials. I know you better than that. Nothing makes me less comfortable than trying to do a commercial, so and we won't do that. And I, I actually do commercials, so, you know. <laughs> you uh, can do the commercials. It, it, it's okay. So, I'm not okay. going to do that now either. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that advertising is important and has been. Maybe it's less important than it used to be. Uh, when I started writing for Forbes 34 years ago, hmm. One of the things that I liked was they owned the demographic of the high net worth, wealthy, that therefore supported the luxury advertising and those two linked. Where do you see luxury advertising fitting into print, supporting it, and what, if anything, has to be done to pull those advertisers into the world that supports print? So, you know, I think there's a lot of fixation um, in ad land and elsewhere with millennials, and that's fine, they're the coming thing. But the money, I mean, the, the, the cohort that we really think about in print is really the boomers. And the boomers over-index in print, and they certainly over-index in wealth. And so that ties very neatly to various advertising propositions, uh, and in particular luxury. Luxury has been, you know, there has been a secular decline in print advertising, that's not news. Um, it's been dramatic in some areas. But in other areas, it's been pretty resilient. And we've certainly found that our luxury advertising built around that demographic uh, is strong and indeed growing. Um, and you know, 40, almost 50% of our weekend FT readers are, are boomers and they're at the affluent, affluent end of that spectrum. So again, I do think it comes down to this. You have to avoid these sort of general conclusions about what formats are working, is print dead? I think like a lot of technologies, uh, when a new thing comes along, the previous formats, previous technologies, just adjust their place on the spectrum. Radio, I think, is still dynamic. Uh, it's survived TV because it's redefined its place on that spectrum, and the same with, with print in news media. So going to the topic of fake news, one person's fake news seems to be believed by another. Credibility is terribly important in the long term for survivability. A, what do you think you do to maximize building credibility? And B, as a subset of that, 
relative to discussion this morning of the platform panel. Mm. Mm. Do you think they'll really take that seriously? What do you think will happen there? Where does that all tie together? <laughs> A couple of big questions there. So firstly, I think the decline of trust in news media is, is tragic. Um, it's real. Uh, the statistics show it. Um, I think for publications like the FT, there's a silver lining. We've definitely seen a strong increase in readership and subscriptions, I think, because people do value that trusted source. We spent 130 years investing in and building trust. Uh, you can't be complacent. You can lose it pretty easy. But at a time like this, I think people do come to areas, uh, to titles and brands that have built that track record of trust. Uh, to your question about the, the platforms, do they uh, take, um, we've always been very careful, by the way, not to bet the farm on platforms. I think a number of publishers got a bit carried away with the reach of Facebook, and you know, frankly, it's pretty enticing, the scale. But we always felt very clearly from a strategic point of view that we must have a direct relationship with our readers, and we weren't going to bet the farm on these platforms. <laughs> Do they get it? Um, I think they need to get it pretty fast. I think it's time for a lot of words to turn into actions. I, I don't think they're all the same. We've seen pretty good progress in areas with Google in terms of developing subscription models. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done. And I think fundamentally where they are, you know, it's that sort of um, kind of time old narrative. They've gone from genesis to um, hubris. They may well now be in crisis. And if they don't sort this out, they will be in nemesis. So I think that there is a realization that this is a moment. I think um, the events around Cambridge Analytica, which I do not think, by the way, is an isolated um, case of um, data abuse. I think this is the troubling thing for me, that this was almost business as usual. Uh, someone said earlier on, how do you define a data breach? This wasn't like a hacking attack. This was just um, wide scale abuse of, of people's data. So I think they need to get serious. Um, we talked a little bit about is regulation the answer. I think that um, it's very easy to throw out a, a phrase like regulation as a cure-all. It's actually really difficult. Um, what does it mean? But I do think um, serious reform needs to be taken around personal data privacy, a bit like GDPR is doing in Europe. But this personal data dimension is crucial. So could you give them a one, two, three? Here's three fast things you should do. I think the frustrating thing, actually, is we've been giving them one, two, three, four, five for two or three years, and nothing's really happened. Um, and there's a lot of talk about making um, the platforms. So I, I don't think you're going to solve this by playing defense. And this idea that you can just police this um, is like a game of whack-a-mole. Yes, you can find a troll farm uh, in Slovakia or, or Moscow, and you can shut it down. But there'll be another one. So you can't just, you, you should play defense, but you can't depend on defense um, to sort this out. You have to support quality journalism. And I've been convinced for a very long time that that requires paid for models to work. Um, I don't necessarily mean hard line paywalls. I mean um, structures and systems that enable uh, publishers to have a direct relationship with their readers and get them to pay for it. So once upon a time, you largely pioneered metering and got a lot of flack for it. Uh, yeah. And now, a decade later, uh, you're pretty much proven right, and all kinds of other people do the same thing. Do you think this then supports metering as well as print? Yeah. Because of credibility? Yeah. So um, basically, about 11 years or so, we decided to charge online. It was pretty lonely then in subscription land. Um, we've evolved the model over time. Um, and frankly, we would be in real trouble if we hadn't, because while we've been seeing a reasonable degree of resilience in our advertising, um, to, to sustain a quality newsroom requires a stable and strong revenue stream that we've managed to develop through subscriptions. And I think a lot of other publishers have moved that way. Uh, I think it's pretty hard, though. It takes a lot of time to build a subscriptions model. Uh, and I worry now with the changes um, in the Facebook feed that we heard about earlier that demotes news, there's going to be a lot of publishers urgently trying to find another source of revenues. And subscriptions is not a quick and easy answer. You have to work at it. It takes a long time. So you used the word uh, model. I think, I think it was last month uh, Mark Thompson said that, uh, or it was interpreted at least that Mark Thompson said that uh, a decade from now print would be gone. 
which ironically was within a couple of days of when uh, they announced that the New York Times would be going into TV. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, the pink's in the pink. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm in Europe, I see very pink imitators um, modeling pretty well after uh, the pink. In terms of model, describe business model that you think survivable that includes print. So I think that um, the key thing is to have that direct relationship with your reader to really understand them. Um, I think that um, the where, where print fits in in the portfolio is a different, so what we basically find now is our, our readers want a different format at different times of the day. We don't necessarily have a, a mobile user or a PC user or a print reader. They tend to be using them all um, at different times of the day for different purposes. And increasingly, I think print is seen more as an in-depth, lean-back type experience, um, appealing more to a slightly older demographic, but actually also to um, a growing number of younger readers, too. So, but it has a different purpose. It's much more of that sort of um, in-depth, um, lean back type reader experience. You don't necessarily, uh, you won't, <laughs> you don't necessarily want to read 2,000 words of Martin Wolf on on a mobile phone, um, uh, although he would probably argue that you would. <laughs> but pushing back on that for a second, um, part of the FT model, which I like a lot, is you've got multiple revenue sources, including premium small publications aimed at focused targeted markets separate from the core pink, generating small volume premium revenue, all of which helps support a newsroom. You've got events. Mm -hmm. This function of news can be revenue sources beyond just simply a piece of paper or an online source and a subscriber. Once upon a time, traditional journalism had the tripod of the classifieds, the subscriber, and the advertiser. Do you see a tripod or stool, multi-leg stool, being built in journalism that helps support that newsroom? Yeah, I think that um, there are really good opportunities to unleash the brand, to um, take effectively those core values of independent quality journalism and extend that into areas like conferences and events. Um, and you can also build specialist niche, must have new sources around that. I think it goes beyond that though. I think that publishers who are gonna be successful, sustainably successful in a world of continuing um, disruption and accelerating change need to completely rethink their assets um, in particular you know, um, you need to think of your readership and audience as an asset, um, how to keep them deeply engaged and, and loyal and give them different products and services. And also a sensitive one is the whole data piece. You know, as you develop that direct relationship with your readers, uh, particularly in digital, um, that data um, becomes a very powerful asset. Of course, it's an asset that needs to be treated with great care. Um, but I think we need to be thinking about how to, to use that in different dimensions of business. We have time for me to ask one more question, I think, before we open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, but I'd like to take a different direction slightly. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a paper in the Association uh, of Magazine Media 18 months ago or so that had a whole slew of academic sources supporting the notion that the reading experience in print versus mobile was different in terms of comprehension, distraction, recall. The facts of that seem pretty heavily documented. The, uh, this was a, a Scott McDonald paper, mm -hmm. it was 2015. Is there a way to document that in a way that advertisers will pay for in print, assuming that there's less distraction? You talk about 40 minutes. Uh, you know, in mobile, people are more, according to this set of studies, more like they're scanning fast. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to document that that advertisers will pay for? So it's obviously harder in print to get that degree of 
data around you know, uh, click-throughs, et cetera. And I think, again, it comes back to this point about understanding what purpose you're serving through different formats. Um, what I would say, though, in terms of the appeal, the enduring and probably increasing appeal of print to a range of advertisers is what we've been talking about this morning, the trust factor. Um, you're not going to have bots moving around taking your ad and putting it next to extreme right um, stories. It just can't happen in print. So I also think the, um, you know, the tactile values, the appeal of, of beautiful ad, um, ad, adverts in print and the trust zone, the trust uh, consideration remain quite powerful. Um, I certainly, you know, the, increasingly what I hear from advertisers is the shock and anger about how some of their advertising has been abused on platforms. They don't know where it's going. They don't know what it's, um, uh, what it's being shown against. You know, it could be in a pretty awful neighborhood, whereas you do know uh, in print the security um, and the safety uh, and the quality of that neighborhood. We were talking this morning earlier, and you were saying that you thought sound was going to be increasingly important. We've got a question here from the audience. Uh, saying that The Economist has an audio version of their print magazine to boost engagement and uh, reduce subscriber churn. Do you see audio as being part of the FT's future product lineup? Yeah, um, we do. And I think that it's the next, so the next phase of quite radical change will have a big audio and voice component. Um, and I think it raises some really big questions for traditional publishers. It's all very well building up um, a million plus subscribers in text <laughs> if, if they'll then want to sort of interface with their devices in voice that raises some big questions uh, we talked about brand and trust but pink ft you know we spent 130 years building the pinkness pink does not um, have a sound so you have to think through questions like that um, so if you look at the statistics the uh, the rise of um, home and voice assistants um, is expected to get in the US alone to something like 870 million um, in four or five years. That's more than double where it is now. It's another one of those exponential curves. And news is one of the big use cases. So it's frankly something we need to um, get to terms with pretty quickly. You know, so it's probably the, the third phase of disruption. First was digital, then mobile. I think voice is going to be an equally disruptive technology that news publishers, you know, done right, it's an opportunity, um, but it needs to be done. Well, now that everyone's used to all the disruption, they're ready for the next phase, right? <laughs> yeah, we just love it. <laughs> so this next question is one that I'm actually interested in myself. As somebody that's written for your paper outside of America for six years, mm. uh, this question is, uh, how does editorial independence work? Uh, how much change has come with the new Japanese owner? Hmm. Um, so they have been um, completely true to their word in terms of um, non-interference in our news coverage. Um, uh, and one of the things um, I love about this new ownership structure is it's a private business. It can therefore take a long-term view. And I think that's really important. Uh, I think uh, Dean made the point earlier too that given how much turmoil and disruption is around there, you really need somebody that is kind of going to back you for the long term. You can't be worried about quarterly earnings when you're trying to deal with some of these changes. And they give us that security. They, they love quality journalism. They're journalists. Um, the senior management team at Nikkei, they're all journalists. I'm a former journalist. They get journalism. They like journalism. Um, they, and they want to grow, which is pretty cool. Would they be interested in buying any other Western media? Uh, we're certainly one of the things we are finding, that we do get support for acquisitions. Uh, yeah, and we see that as a way to grow. Um, so they're very supportive on that front as well. So. The next question, I'm just going to broaden a little bit. The question directly is, what technology changes keep you awake at night? But beyond that, just generally, what changes that we haven't talked about so far today keep you awake at night? So I mentioned voice. I think that's as much an opportunity um, as, a, um, as a threat. I clearly think that AI um, and blockchain raise some pretty big questions for um, news publishers, and particularly for business news publishers. I mean, if you think a lot of our audience are involved in finance, fund management, <laughs> investment, uh, you know, we had a big piece yesterday about They how. just think they are. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, you know, the auto, you know, automation of a lot of that and using AI is potentially a big disruptive threat to a lot of our readers. So it's not just 
the news industry gets disrupted. It's like a lot of our traditional audiences and readers get disrupted. And uh, I don't know whether you know AI and bots buy the FT, um, but it's a you know it's a challenge out there. So we already covered the uh, the tech platforms, uh, but what we haven't covered uh, as one last fast question is the FT's approach to video. Uh, is it a revenue stream? Is it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Content. Uh, it's, what, what's its purpose? Its purpose is to. It's it's very valuable as a, as a reach driver. Um, we put a lot of video out there to make people familiar uh, with the FT. Uh, it's a pretty good revenue stream. We did pretty well um, in revenues from video. Um, but the key point is that the editorial dimension and the way we do video has to have the same sort of journalistic standards uh, integrity. Um, as anything we do in any other format, whether it's print or, or voice. Well, we are basically out of time, but I do want to thank you as the CEO of the FT for having the FT have this event for everyone that's here. Uh, this is a spectacular event. It's a spectacular thing to see everyone in the room talking on this topic. So, John, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you all. Thanks very much. Okay.